thank you, Pedro. In fact, the name of the uh, of this charla, this conference, is uh, Seven Lessons the Cubans Can Learn from the Taiwanese. And I would like to dedicate these words to Antonio Jorge, which was a good friend of us. Is your microphone on? I think so, yeah. Hello? Yeah, yeah it, it, it works. I have to, to be closer to OK, I, I would like to dedicate these words to the memorial of Antonio Jorge, who died recently, and he was a good friend of, us, of all of us. Uh, by the way, he was a distinguished uh, economist. It is an honor to share this table with a group of uh, distinguished Taiwanese and prestigious Cuban academicians who are, in addition, good friends, as is the case of uh, Dr. Pedro Roy. The topic that was proposed to me is fascinating. Can the Taiwanese model of development be useful for the Cubans? In fact, everything I will say about Taiwan and Cuba is useful for whole Latin America. Therefore, I will use this material for my column next Sunday. <laughs> Let me begin by making a couple of provisos. First, we must be very careful when we speak of models of development. We have a tendency to believe that there is something like a mathematical formula that when applied always gives us the same results. Wish that were true. What it so, it would be relatively simple to turn Haiti into Holland. That's not the case. Second, it is convenient to make clear that in market economies characterized by the free decision making of millions of people, the main feature is constant change, which makes it almost impossible to apply a rigid model. In reality, more than models, what we have are government measures that, in a specific cultures and under a specific circumstances, either succeeded or failed. Those measures, utilized by other nations, may or may not achieve similar results. On the other hand, the obvious difference between Taiwan and Cuba should not dishearten us. After all, they are two relatively small islands situated in intricate and dangerous geographic crossroads with violent histories that in the past several decades have moved in opposite directions. Anyway, the Cubans, in fact, can learn certain lessons from Taiwan's experience. The Taiwanese have peacefully conquered increasingly greater domains of prosperity and civil liberties until they become one of the world's biggest success. Even though that they have been permanently threatened and blockaded by a major nuclear power, mainland China, that forced them to spend large amounts of money for defense. At the other end, the Cubans, almost in the same period, have gradually become poorer and poorer under the direction of a totalitarian government incapable of changing its course. A government that tries to hide the failure of the regime behind the alibi of the US embargo and the supposed danger of military aggression, which hasn't existed for half a century since the 1962 Kennedy and Khrushchev put an end to the missile crisis. <clears throat> what, therefore, should the Cubans learn from those, from those other islanders? I think there are at least seven general lessons that could be very useful for us Cubans as we try to ambition our future. First lesson, there are no immutable fates. In four decades, Taiwan managed to overcome the traditional poverty and despotism the country had suffered for centuries until it became a first world nation with a purchase, purchasing power parity of PPP per capita of $37,900 per year. This economic miracle was accomplished 
in only two generations, millions of Taiwanese who were very poor young people in 1949 died half a century later enjoying the lifestyles of the middle class in the Western world. That's a miracle. Poverty or prosperity are elective in our times. Second lesson, the theory of dependence is totally false. The world's wealthy nations, the so-called center, have not assigned to the nations of the economic periphery the role of supplier or provider of raw material to perpetuate the relations, that relationship of vassalage. No country, except perhaps mainland China, has attempted to harm Taiwan. That paranoid vision of international relations does not match reality. We don't live in a world of executioner countries and victim countries. That's not true. Third lesson. Development can and should be for the benefit of all, not just a few. But the equitable distribution of wealth is not decreed by redistribution what has been created. It is achieved by gradually adding value to production. The Taiwanese not only went from possessing an agricultural economy to an industrial economy, but they also did it through the incorporation of technological advance applied to industry. The workers at a chips factory earns more than a farmer who harvests sugar cane because of what he produces has a much greater value in the market. This explains why Taiwan's Gini index is 32.6, much better a large, much better than all of Latin America. Only 1.16% of the inhabitants of Taiwan are below the threshold of extreme poverty. Fourth lesson, wealth in Taiwan is basically created by private enterprise. The state, which was very strong and interventionistic in the past, has been withdrawing from productive, from productive activity. The state cannot produce efficiently because it is not trained to satisfy demand and thereby generate profits. Instead, it usually returns favors to the managers who are its own cadres and foments political patronage, pure clientelismo. Fifth lesson, in the often quoted beginning of Anna Karenina, Tostoy states that all happy families are alike while every unhappy family is unhappy in its own way. That observation can be applied to the four Asian dragons or tigers, Taiwan, Singapore, South Korea, and Hong Kong. Although the four have taken partially different roads toward the group of happy families on the planet, they resemble each other in the following five features. One, they have created open economic systems based on the market and the existence of private property. Two, the government maintains a stability by watching over the basic elements of macroeconomic, inflation, public expenditure, fiscal balance, and consequently, the value of their currency. With that, they foster saving, investments, and growth. Third, or three, they have gradually improved the rule of law. Investors and economic agents have clear rules and trustworthy tribunals that allow them to make a long-term investments and develop complex projects. Four, they have open themselves to international cooperation by strongly playing the globalization card and betting on the production and exportation of goods and services in which they are competitive instead of the economic nationalism that postulates the substitution of imports. Five, they have stressed education, the incorporation of women 
into the labor sector and voluntary family planning. Let's return to the seven lessons, the sixth lesson. The case of Taiwan demonstrates that a country government by a single strong hand party can peacefully evolve toward democracy and the multi-party system without persecuting or harming those who held power until the changeover. The essence of democracy is just that, the alternation and existence of vigorous opposition parties that audit, review, and criticize the work of the government. Seven lesson, the last one. In essence, the Taiwanese case proved to the Cubans the superior value of freedom. Freedom consists in being able to make individual decisions in all aspects of life. One's personal destiny, the economy, the civic existence, the family. There is no contradiction whatsoever between freedom and development. The freer a society is, the more prosperity it can achieve, so long as the vast majority of the people submit voluntarily and responsibly to the rule of law. The Taiwanese have increasingly acquired control over their lives through the exercise of freedom. In sum, that is the great Taiwanese lesson for the Cubans. Freedom is possible. Freedom is convenient. Freedom is not a luxury. That is something that the Mambises may have sensed in the 19th century when they adopted a beautiful wish as their battle cry, Viva Cuba Libre. Thank you.